All right, welcome back. So um, I guess we wanted to start by asking uh, different groups. So, so how, how were your discussions like? Uh, what, did, what did you think was the answer? If there, well, I'm not sure there's a unique answer to be had for this question based on the paper, but uh, nonetheless, uh, yeah, sorry for cutting the discussion short. I see uh, several of you asking. <laughs> uh, apologies for pulling you back. But uh, anyone want to volunteer, say what they, Came up with. I can pick on people. Uh, Bill, I guess you were saying you guys wanted more time, but uh, what did you get to? Oh, I guess we were just we were just uh, confused about many different points in the paper, um, namely the cryptographic game, uh, like uh, I said, someone said something about the um, F stars memory model. Um, and also, uh, uh, some, some grievance about, um, um, Everest not being fully verified yet, but, um, the paper stating that any problems that come about wouldn't be Everest's like issue or whatever, something like that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, at some level, a weird paper, because it's a mix, as you can tell, of like, you know, clearly deep technical details that they figured out somewhere, but it's an overview paper and the project is not even done yet. Um, so uh, it's a little bit hard to pin down exactly how anything in particular works from this paper. There's more detailed papers um, that describe some aspects of it. Uh, but indeed, it's sort of a, a lot going on at once. We were sort of hoping to use this paper partly to sort of describe the kinds of verification projects that are going on and why verification is exciting and what it takes to pull off something large in this space. Um, but indeed, there's a lot going on here with F-Star and, and yeah, this game thing is like one page, which is a whole thesis of its own. <laughs> yeah. So anyone else uh, got to anything else about this game um, spec? I guess just about the question specifically, we thought that the answer could be something along the lines of um, the assumptions are that the core algorithms for some kind of like their example is AAD. So the, the core algorithms such as like the stream cipher and the Mac, I think are correct. And then they use that and um, like set up kind of the idealized version in F star and that supplements the real version in low star and they use that to um, do the Yeah, so I think that's what's going on. Uh, I should say probably Tej uh, maybe is the, has more closely experience with this since he's worked with F star and I've only read about it on paper. Uh, but as far as I understand this sort of one page description and some background papers they've written about this, they sort of set up little two universes where um, the, there's these APIs like you see in this encrypt snippet where this encrypt function could do one of two things. Either it does this like magic thing where they log what the value should be encrypted to and so on, or they do the real thing. And they basically implement their whole software stack. And at every level, they have this magic thing that could be either a magic log or the real implementation. And then the code that connects them together is basically one piece of code but they prove it for any setting of the flag value. So they basically prove that the same implementation of this AEAD is correct, regardless of whether you use the same implementation and these magic idealized things or with the real implementation of ChaCha and Poly implementing the real AEAD. Um, so in some ways, it's this kind of clever trick that makes this work and makes this relatively simple in F star. So one sort of really important thing that they're not proving, as far as I can tell, is anything about these epsilons, the small probabilities. Um, because it's computational limited, um, these guys are not talking at all about, uh, or there, there's a probability uh, that the bad guy guesses your key randomly. But they basically have this sort of clever trick that sort of just swipes it under the carpet, if you will. Um, it's like preserves the probability is the same up the stack, perhaps. Um, does not explicitly reason about um, what this epsilon probability is. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think what's pretty tricky in this uh, paper is uh, the game-based cryptography is really not explained, and you don't really see any games in this paper. Um, so in particular, like game-based security is like this overall approach to specifying and verifying crypto cryptographic protocols. Um, and I think what's going on is sort of 
there's a proof that you need to do an F star, and then you need to compose it off to the side with a cryptographic argument that has epsilons and probabilities. Um, that's not in this paper. Um, what's in this paper is just how they model encryption and decryption. Anyone else uh, want to add to what we've been talking about? Wait, I so I, I particularly didn't understand the log um, part, like how the magic log works. Oh, the, the, the log is like, okay, here's their worldview of what a magic encryption box is. Uh, in the background, there's a global log that is shared between the guy that encrypts and the guy that decrypts. In reality, of course, this log doesn't exist, but in their magic view of the world, when you encrypt, you just generate a random string to represent the encrypted value. You can't really decrypt this because it's truly random. But what you do is you stick in the log a message saying, well, someone gave me this plain text data and I pretended to encrypt it to this random blob. And then when the decryptor guy goes to decrypt something, they get some random ciphertext. They can't possibly decrypt this. But what they do is they look in this magic log and they say, see if there's ever a record that someone encrypted and used this random blob as if it was an encryption of some plain text data. So if the decryption guy finds this entry in the log, then they can say, oh yeah, that's what uh, this decrypts to. But if someone intercepts that, right? Like if Eve's in the middle and intercepts Alice's message to Bob, right? Like wouldn't that, couldn't Eve just look it up in the, in the log and then- So the log is totally a logical thing that's used as part of the proof. And in the proof, they imagine uh, that only the, uh, so the, the, this log logically for them is part of the key. So the, in reality, the key is an immutable set of bits. But in their logical view, this key is kind of the shared mutable thing where if someone has access to the key and encrypts, they can add stuff to the log of the key. And if someone has access to the key and decrypts, they can look at the log. But if the guy in the middle, Eve, intercepts the message, she doesn't have access to the key. So she doesn't have access to the log because the log is sort of in the key in their model of this, how this computation runs. There's actually a semi-practical encryption scheme that's surprisingly close to this totally impractical magic log, which is the so-called one-time pad, where the notion is that um, I'm, I make up a very long string of random zeros and ones, and I, then I send it by FedEx to the guy that I want to communicate with. And then in, when I want to send him a message, I take a chunk of these zeros and ones and XOR it with the message, tell him where the chunk is in the giant long string and he when he receives this the ciphertext he XORs it, XORs it with his, his copy of the key and gets the plain text back and this, this is perfectly secure in exactly the same information theoretic way as the log okay um, the reason people don't use this scheme in practice is that it, there are too many bits of key to ship around yeah, so both this one-time pad and the log are enormous. The log is not even practical because you need a way to ship Because the there's no communication mechanism. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, at least for the one-time pad. You the one-time pad is sort of a way of saying, yes, we're going to have to do a lot of communication, but we can do it all bef beforehand. We don't have to wait until we're ready to communicate. The, what's wrong I with I think, Amanda, directly to your pad. question, I think what's going on is that if the attacker, if the software screws up and this key is available to the attacker, then the attacker can also decrypt because the key has the log. Okay, but then it becomes a separate sub problem of let's not let the attacker get the key. Exactly, exactly, right. which is what you want to do. You want to reduce it down to protecting the key instead of protecting the data. Okay. So is the log like almost like a log of messages, like plain text? But like exactly, yeah, actually, if you look at what syntactically they're sticking in the log, uh, if you look at this uh, gray sort of box on their page, you can see that encrypt takes the plain text P and part of the thing that they are sticking in the log is actually P. It's pairs of plain text and ciphertext. Yeah, as well as this like nonce and some other things, but indeed uh, there, yeah.
I, I still don't understand how this shows security at all or how it proves anything, but. Anyway. Okay, so what, okay, so um, I think how it sort of represents the notion of encryption is that it gives you an idealized view of what encryption does, which is that syntactically, encryption returns random data that is independent of the plain text that you are trying to encrypt. And then the only question remaining is sort of how the heck does decryption work? If you return random data, how are you going to get the original thing back? And the way they get the original thing back is that they say, well, part of the key is sort of a record of all the stuff that you encrypted. So whoever has access to the key can use this log associated with the key to look up what was the plain text that was encrypted when I got this random ciphertext out. And then you can invert it. So this also captures this notion that whoever has access to the key can decrypt all the messages that were ever encrypted. And someone that does not have access to the key can't tell anything more because the ciphertext is truly random. And this, by the way, is why it's essential to have the nonce. Because otherwise, if you wanted to send the same message twice, you would get the same ciphertext, and that would be disastrous. Sort of classic example is you send a message to, you know, buy a book to Amazon. And if there's no nonce, then the bad guy can take your message and send it 10 times, and then you'll get 10 books. Uh, but if there's a nonce, perhaps Amazon can keep track of the nonces and make sure that there's one book per nonce charged to your credit card. What exactly is a nonce? Could you explain that? So a nonce here is a sort of a unique value that uh, ensure that allows you to sort of reason about intended messages if the message is intended to sort of trigger an operation or or you want to reason about how many times was something sent as opposed to someone sent it at some point in the past. Okay, and if you've already seen that nonce, then it's no, it's a- Yeah, so a typical usage pattern is that uh, the receiver would keep track of the nonces they've seen. And if they already see a nonce uh, in the past that they've sort of already processed in a sense, then they say, oh, well, that's a duplicate message. I've already seen that. Whereas if they see a message with a new nonce, they can say, well, I haven't processed that. This way, you can send multiple messages that are really the same message, like I want to buy a book, and tomorrow I want to buy the same book again. And I can represent that by sending the same message by a book with two different nonsense. Then Amazon knows, yeah, I really wanted to do that. As opposed Crypto to that is a guy. fascinating subject, but we could easily spend the entire hour and a half on it. Fair enough. Yes. All right. <laughs> so let me <laughs> go ahead, Butler. Yeah, I don't want to take away your lecture. Here. Which is perfectly okay with me. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I thought we'd kind of lost track of what we were doing. Indeed, yeah. Right. Okay, so in the remaining hour, um, we'll talk about this paper. This paper is a little bit, uh, whoops, what happened? There we go. So this pa paper is an attempt to solve the following problem. There's a huge pile of code out there that tries to provide security for communication over the internet. And it's, we have empirical evidence that it's full of bugs, which is bad because it means that at least in principle, all kinds of bad guys could be getting in there and doing all kinds of terrible things because of the bugs. So let's just you know, spend a little bit of time reviewing uh, how to think about this issue. To what extent is the Everest project solving a real problem and to what extent is it just an academic exercise? So the protocol that they're addressing, which is SSL, which has been renamed TLS, that was my fault, by the way, because Netscape introduced SSL 20 odd years ago. And when I joined Microsoft, we had a fairly active crypto group and I was chatting with them and I said, we should really compete with SSL, which was not, not a very good idea but they took the bit between their teeth and they invented their own thing, which I think was called PCT. And then there was a huge amount of standards jockeying at the end of which it was agreed that they would basically rename SSL as TLS and pretend that it was an agreed upon standard. Anyway, um, this is used, originally it was built for providing secure connections with, between a browser and a, and a, a 
web, web page server so that, for example, you could securely buy things from Amazon. Um, but it's now used not only for that, but for almost all other uh, secure connections that you establish over the internet. So it's important. Um, it's also full of bugs. Uh, people keep track of, of bugs in security protocols using this, which are called vulnerabilities. And there's a public record of them. And you get a, about, um, what is it, five of them per month for, for, for TLS. And some of them are really quite catastrophic. The one that was the most dramatic uh, was the heart bleed bug, which had the property that you, you could send a message to a, you as the, a completely untrusted uh, person uh, could send a message to a web server that was running the most popular version of TL, implementation of TLS. Yeah. And that, that message would cause that server to disgorge its, all of its secrets and give them to you. So that was really, really bad. Um, this really, well, by the way, was the result of a, of a buffer overflow triggered by a, a mi misconfigured length in some message that was actually um, not at all relevant to the TLS protocol it was added as a hack because some random standards person thought it would be a good idea. And the consequence yeah. was that to expose a large fraction of all the SSL uh, servers in the world to the, this sort of worst case, worst case, nothing could be worse than this uh, problem. Most of the flaws that people have found in TLS have been, in my opinion, uh, much less serious because most of them depend on being able to mount what's called a man in the middle attack, which means that you can actually get your hands on the bits, the encrypted bits that one party to the communication is sending and fiddle with them as much as you want and then send them on to the other party. And to actually execute a man in the middle attack is not, you can do, do it do it easily enough for a paper, but to ex execute it in real life is not actually so straightforward. Um, so how serious are these problems? Well, the way to th that I like to think about yeah. this is in terms of the old story about the hunters and the bear. There are two hunters in the woods of Alaska and they come across a grizzly bear. And one of them says, we better run. And the second one says, it won't do any good. You can't outrun a bear. And the first one says, I know that, but I don't have to outrun the bear. I only have to outrun you. So the point of that is um, you don't want your flaw to be the one that's most easily exploited. On the other hand, if you have a flaw that is much harder to exploit than several other flaws, then it's really, really, from a practical point of view, doesn't make that much difference because the bad guy is going to go after one of the easier to exploit things rather than going after your flaw. So as I said, the worst case uh, is that you send a, you actually send a bad message. And that was the heart bleed example, which was really, really disastrous. Um, most of these other things require why is this not going away? Oh, that's, no, sorry. I'm not fully reconciled to the, the, the details of how um, scribbling on, on the shared screen works in, in Zoom. Um, so if you, can, if you can exploit a flaw by just sending a bad message out of the blue, that's very, very bad because anybody could do it. You don't need, yeah, you do. You don't need to get your hands on the network at all. Um, if you need to be a man in the middle, then you need to you know, have some way to redirect the actual network traffic, which is a much more difficult thing to manage. Um, what this means is that when you read about these flaws in the press, either the academic press or the, the mainstream press, in my opinion, you, you have to take what you read with you know, men, quite a few grains of salt 
Uh, the most recent example of this does not have to do with PLS, but it was the giant flap about the spectrum meltdown bugs triggered by uh, speculative execution. And it, this um, caused a lot of bad publicity for uh, companies that make speculative execution CPUs, which is most of the CPUs in the world these days. But again, my personal opinion is that, that this problem is way overblown because actually doing harm by exploiting this class of vulnerabilities is pretty hard. Almost cer certainly you can find easier ways to do it. Um, the flip side is that in some kinds of communication are extremely, uh, extremely valuable and people are gonna be very highly motivated to, to break this, their security. And the obvious examples of this are, are critical national intelligence where the, the way the, the intelligence people like to talk about it, the ideal um, exploit of a vulnerability yeah. is, is that you put in a very, yeah. an indetectable, possibly very slow channel that can stay in place for years that allows you to drain out possibly fairly small amounts of information over long periods of time. This is the thing that they really worry about. Uh, and things that involve men in the middle attacks are, yeah. for example, are unlikely to have this property because you won't be able to keep the men in the middle in place without leaving a lot of traces. Um, another example where you might be very strongly motivated to, to break something is finance, where uh, forged encrypted messages can ca cause the transfer of billions of dollars. Um, and we've seen this happen several times in the last few years. Uh, supposedly, uh, Bitcoin exchanges have lost hundreds of millions of dollars as a result of flaws in their protocols. Um, and the, the National Bank of Bangladesh lost a few hundred million dollars. In that case, it was because their internal controls were circumvented and, pe and people at the bank were able to use the bank's credentials to, to um, send, send messages that requested the, the transfer of this money. So that can't really be blamed on any of the communication protocols. On the other, at the opposite extreme you have, um, is it really important to secure your connection to Amazon? I think if you ask the man in the street, this question, the answer will be, oh yes, I don't want um, my account at Amazon and my stored credit card to be used to buy things um, that I didn't ask for. But the truth of the matter is that it's, really not that big of an issue because you buy things with credit cards and, and, and um, those, those transactions can be, can be reversed. So stepping back several steps from the content of this paper and asking, are these problems real? The answer is yes, but they're, they're not nearly as widespread as uh, you might think from reading the press. Oops, why did we go that way? Okay, so the Everest project, what's going on here? Well, their idea is, okay, uh, sorry, at the top of the slide, I've put a, a, an extremely uh, abstracted sketch of the different components that are involved in getting from doing something in a browser uh, down to the actual hardware and network. So at the top, you have the client browser and the server, which you can think of as being Amazon. And they, they go through HTTPS and TLS to get the communication between the two of them uh, in, 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 encrypted. Those things depend on the, the operating system, which in turn depends on the hardware. And the communication, of course, dep depends on the network interface card and also on the network. So what does exactly this TLS do for you. It means that failures of security in the network or the net network interface card are not going to affect the security of the communication. And the reason that's true is that those guys only get to see the ciphertext. So if the ciphertext, yeah. 
ciphertext is secured the way it's supposed to be, um, if they mess up, the worst thing that can happen is that a message doesn't get through. What cannot happen is, is that a message that wasn't actually sent gets delivered or that the bad guy uh, get, gets to read a message. So that's what's going on in this project is an attempt to secure those bold face components, HTTPS and TLS of the entire stack. Is this worthwhile? Well, yeah, yes, in the sense that we've definitely seen um, bugs that can compromise the security of messages set up with TLS and HTTPS. For the most part, well, these bugs have many flavors and we've to, I talked about it a little bit uh, earlier and I'll talk about the other aspects of the, of the problems with HTTPS and TLS as we go along. Later on in this course, we'll talk about how to get the operating system out of the trusted computing base, uh, but not today. So why particularly focus on trying to get the network out of the computing, trusted computing base? The answer is because you don't have any control over what's going on in the network, whereas at least in principle, you have a fair amount of control over what's going on on your desk. Uh, look at it another way. It's very easy for someone sitting in Russia to hack around on the, on the internet anywhere in the world, whereas to, for someone sitting in Russia to hack around on your, on your own machine, they have to actually compromise that particular piece of software. So the goal of the Everest project, and it's a fairly ambitious goal, is to make the whole HTTPS TLS story secure. Um, this project has been going on for several years now, and it's an ongoing project, and it has many parts. Uh, you can find out a lot more about it by typing Everest project into Google. Which, which will lead you to the Microsoft Research and the GitHub pages for this project. And um, I've been giving you a sketch taken off of that, taken off of that website, of those websites, off the GitHub site, I think, actually, of what they say are the different parts of, of Everest today. Not all of these things existed at the time that they wrote the paper. So it, it is ongoing and, and it, Doubtless it will continue to evolve. Okay, so the hope that they have then is to definitively solve the problem of the security of communication over the internet, or to look at it another way, to reduce it to a previously unsolved problem, which is the security of executing code on your own machine and on the server machine. And there's basically two challenges, looking at it at the highest level. There's two challenges of doing things this way with achieving this goal. The first challenge is to get a pile of code that's actually correct. It doesn't have any of these bugs that we've been talking about. And the second challenge is to get that code deployed widely enough that it actually makes a difference yeah. to the security of what's going on on the internet. So this paper is mostly focused on the first question and in fact, yeah. Yeah on some relatively narrow aspects of the first question. How do you make the code correct? The, the paper doesn't have a lot to say about the, their strategy for, for deployment, but I, I want to spend some time discussing that. Um, oh, you me? have a question. Um, oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, feel free to interrupt. Yeah, so I just, I wanted to clarify exactly what verified means in this sense. Does it mean that it's, mathematically correct and without bugs? Or does it, in this case, also go so far as verifying that there are no side channels? Um, because like the, the paper seems to only kind of briefly mention um, side channels and doesn't really go in depth into how they know that they're missing that. That's a good question. I'm, I'm gonna talk about it in some detail in just a minute. Uh, the answer is they're doing something about side channels, but not everything. Because doing everything is not really practical. So their, their approach to the problem of deployment is, has two parts. One part is uh, write the deployed 
code in some combination of vanilla C and vanilla uh, assembly language, in this case, I believe for the x86, and give it an yeah, interface that's the same as the, inter as the popular interfaces, as the popular interface that's currently deployed for, for, TLS, for TLS, which it is the so-called so open SSL interface. And you know, that's why they call this a drop-in replacement, because the notion is that they're giving you this pile of code, it's different bits from the bits you have now from open SSL, if you just replace the open SSL bits with these bits, everything will work exactly, exactly the same, except perhaps if you're misusing open SSL you know, so outrageously that the, that the new code complains, in which case presumably you don't want it to work. So that's the deployment strategy, and I'm not going to talk about that anymore, except, except to uh, point out the play, you know, places where it, it means that they have to, to do something that's harder than what you might wish. So their approach is you write, you're gonna write specs for the various components of this system and, and the corresponding code in a language called F star, which you can roughly speaking, think of as being caught without tactics, but with an SMT solver that can magically do, do a lot of the things that tactics can do. And in, perhaps in a somewhat unpredictable way. The code that they actually want to run has to be written in a subset of F star called low star, which has the proper property that they, they can erase all the fancy dependence type, dependent type and other rigmarole that F star has and extract it to vanilla C. And then you can compile the vanilla C either with CompCert if you want a verified compiler or with GCC or whatever if you want faster code. So that's the strategy for code. Write it in this subset of F star and extract it to C. The strategy for proof is to do the proof in F star in a way that at, the high, at a very high level of, of abstraction is similar to the way you would do the proof in COP. And then in order to be able to compete with, with the assembly code that people have deployed for the low level cryptographic operations, they have this scheme, which I'm not gonna talk about anymore, called VAIL, for writing verified assembly code. Very loosely speaking, you could say that, that you're writing this verified assembly code in F star. So the first question you might ask about this grandiose project is, could this possibly work? And there's two senses of work in my view. There's work in real life and work against academic attacks. Um, there are some reasons to think that an approach like this could work in real li life. And if you wanna look into that further, you might wanna read the pa paper that I've cited here, which is a descri description of the experience that, that, that DARPA had with a program called Hackums, which, which was an attempt to, uh, to build a high assurance version of the software to control uh, some piece of unmanned, unmanned aircraft equipment, I think. And yeah. they, they took the existing software and they rewrote it in a high assurance style and they chartered a fairly aggressive red team to try to break it. And the red team was not successful in breaking into it. So there, there, there's, and, and this problem is in many respects, I think easier than the problem that the Hackam guys were addressing, although yeah, in some ways it's, it's more difficult. Yeah. Could this work against academic attacks? Well, that probably, an, an academic attack means that yeah. you get to deploy the code that you're trying to break, break in, in, a, in an idealized, in an environment that's idealized for the attacker. So for example, yeah. an academic, academic an academic attack will certainly try to, will certainly use man in the middle attacks. Whereas as I said before, deploying man in the middle attacks on the real internet is certainly not impossible, but it's, it's not that easy. Um, I don't, this paper does not say, and I do not actually know, know um, 
to, to what extent yeah, uh, people have accumulated yeah, any real real world experience about the yeah. uh, improved security of, of Everest yeah, TLS versus OpenSSL TLS. Why is it doing that? Oh, I know why it's doing that. Okay, so what does it mean to have security for, for TLS? Um, well, it means a number of different things. This picture over on the right-hand side shows is taken out of the, of the paper and it shows that there are quite a few different pieces. The stuff in the um, center oval box is the stuff that's inside of Everest. And you can see that it mediates between various clients and servers like browsers or WebKit or Skype or whatever. And sorry, various client pieces of client software like browsers and various pieces of server software like Apache. Because that's what TLS does is it connects those clients with those servers. On the bottom, it depends on having an untrusted net network on which you run TCP and UDP. And in the middle, there are quite a few pieces of moving parts. There's the HTTPS protocol, there's X509 certificates, which are encoded in a, in a rather baroque bi binary standard called ASN1. There's the TLS protocol, and then there's a bunch of crypto algorithms like RSA and AES and SHA and so forth. And then the, the uh, Ciphertech gets dumped into network buffers to, from which it goes out onto the untrusted network. So the first question you might ask about, can we make all this correct is, what, is, what does it mean for it to be correct? What it means for it to be correct is that it satisfies some spec. Well, what's the spec? Uh, this paper doesn't go into much detail about this, but if you, if you uh, look up this 2012 paper called The Most Dangerous Code in the World, you will see that the actual spec for deployed TLS today is very com complicated and very, very easy to misuse. And that there are, and they, they give you innumerable examples of ways in which that spec has been misused. The effect of which you know, is that you, you lose almost all of the security prop properties that were that were being, that were intended. You might hope that the spec would say something like, "Give me a so socket with, which allows me to connect to this um, um, DNS name using these crypto parameters," and the result is either a, a, a socket that's actually secure on the one hand, or an error message. It turns out that the actual specs for deployed uh, TLS are not like this at all. They're much more complicated. They have all kinds of, kinds of complicated defaults and ways that you can, can misuse the crypto parameters and all kinds of other things that I'm not gonna spend any time on. So let's suppose we just have this spec. Then the goal of the Everest project is to produce a proof in, in F star that the actual communication uh, satisfies the, the spec for secure communication across this socket. Suppose you succeed in that goal and you get F star to say proved. What could still be, what could still go wrong? Well, obviously the spec could be wrong. That's, that's the most obvious thing. Um, F star itself, the, the whole proving mechanism could, ha could have bugs. And F star does not have the property that you can, as far as I know, Tej maybe will correct me if I'm wrong about this, does not have the property that you can check the proof much more easily than you can generate it. Um, the certificates could be messed up and it, that turns out to be a huge problem. Um, you depend on, on um, digitally signed pieces of information called certificates to know what amazon.com's public key is so that you can know whether you're actually communicating with amazon.com or with somebody else. And there's many, many ways for that to go wrong, which, a few of which we'll touch on. Then there's of course the semantics of the CPU. If, if there are bugs in, in the way the instructions are being executed, the proof isn't, isn't helpful. 
then there's the operating system yet, which can get in there and mess things up more or less arbitrarily. So those are all the other ways in which things might get into trouble. Okay, now let's just look at some of the some of the pieces of this. Um, the, the lowest level and and cleanest piece of the whole story is the, is the crypto story. So how does crypto work? The basic idea of crypto is you have two operations called en encrypt and decrypt, which are inverses of each other in the sense that you, if you decrypt with key K, the something that was encrypted with key K, you get it back, you get M back. And if you try to decrypt anything else, you get an error. And there's a corresponding thing for, for, for signatures. If you sign something with the key K and you verify it with, with the same key and the verification says true, then it must have been signed by, by the corresponding signing key and otherwise you get an error. So those are the primitives of cryptography. And you, you, can, you, know, you can see that those are very well modeled by the log, well, the, 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 the encrypt and decrypt one is very well modeled by the log story that we were talking about earlier. Oh, that's distressing. I forgot to erase these guys. Those aren't supposed to be there. All right. Real crypto, of course, doesn't do that perfectly. It only does it within some error, epsilon. Yeah, the, the simple, the most conservative way to think about, least conservative way to think about that is if the key is, is n bits long, yeah. then you have one, one chance in two to the n of just guessing the key and being able to do the decryption. And the only way around that is to make the key as long as the message using the one-time pad scheme that I, that I sketched out earlier. The other way in which um, ac actual real life crypto can go wrong in addition to the one minus epsilon way is that real life crypto is based on the assumption that certain uh, combinatorial problems are hard. And that, that might turn out not to, such as factoring, for example, and that might turn out not to be true. So that's the lowest level. And we, we talked at the beginning of the, of the class about um, how, how Everest deals with the lowest level. Then on top of that, you build up for arbitrary messages from these basic algorithms. The basic algorithms only encrypt, the single, only deal with single blocks of fixed size blocks of data. And of course, you want to be able to encrypt, encrypt a whole string of messages. So you need a fair amount of machinery to get from the basic algorithms up to that. And that, that's what the, the so-called game playing story is all about. It's showing that, assuming that the basic algorithms are, are secure, the, the built up uh, arbitrary length message algorithms are also secure. The other thing to say about the crypto part of this whole story is that people worry a lot about the performance of crypto. They probably worry about it somewhat more than they really need to. Uh, certainly uh, modern uh, top of the line crypto implementations are by no, no means the bottleneck in, in, uh, in communication anymore. But people have lavished a, a lot of effort on crypto on, on uh, yeah. very efficient implementations of the ba basic uh, crypto primitives. And the state of the art for encrypting data is approximately slightly less than one cycle per byte on a, on a machine like a modern uh, x86 or ARM machine that has specialized instructions for, uh, for doing some of, the, some of the calculations that need to be done. And this, this, um, uh, this performance is achieved by the best open SSL code. At the time that this paper was written, they were off by from this best performance by a factor of about six. But in the last two or three years, they've done a lot of work and they ha have a new thing called EverCrypt, which is written up in a paper that you can find from the website. Uh, and they, they claim that they have fully verified implementations for the, for the data encryption that, uh, that are just as fast as the unverified ones. So that's pleasing.
And by the way, no, I won't go into that. Oops. Side channels. Uh, Alex, you asked about side channels, and here we are. Um, what, is, what are side channels all about? Well, at a high level of abstraction, what side channels are about is that the spec is not complete. The, the spec typically tells you the, what, are, what the contents of the machine registers at the end of a piece of code are going to be, uh, given what they were at the beginning. But the spec doesn't tell you how long it took to execute the, the code typically. And it do, doesn't tell you about the po other, other possibilities like what it's going to, how much it's going to mess around with the cache, whether it's going to execute speculatively and so forth. And all of those are things that leak information about what the code is doing. And if you, uh, if, if you um, have the opportunity to attack the code many times, for example, by giving it uh, lots of different ciphertexts and lots of different keys, to, you know, sorry, lots of different um, data with which to encrypt given a key that you're trying to break. It turns out that a, a surprisingly small amount of information per try is enough, you know, enough to allow you to you know, ex extract um, you know, enough of the bits of the key that you can break it. The way I like to think about this is, although in principle abstractions can keep secrets, in practice they don't, they leak, because specify, you know, every aspect of the abstraction's behavior is pretty hard, and most of it is not important for the correctness of the code that's going to use the application, unless you're worrying about these side channel issues. And my slogan for side, I don't, you know, there's been a huge amount of work done on side channels. My slogan for side channels is if you worry about side channels, don't share resources. And if you don't share resources, then you won't have to worry about side channels because they all depend on the interact uh, on the way, way in which the execution of the code affects resources that aren't mentioned in the spec. But, uh, but people do worry about side channels a lot, and these guys have worried about a particular class of side channel, which are the so-called timing dependent um, side channels in, in the execution of crypto code. And roughly speaking, the idea is if the code branches on any aspect of the, on anything that depends on the key, and it does different things on the, on, you know, on the two branches, then probably the amount of time it takes to run is going to reveal something about the key. And, and people have been able to do um, sort of ideal, you know, adversary attacks in which they can extract keys based, based on this kind of information. So it's currently a crypto religion that your code should not, should, should execute and should not be timing dependent in the sense that the time it takes to run should not depend on anything about the key. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say anything more than I already did about the speculative execution attacks. But there are lots of other side channels that you cannot uh, that require some form of physical access you know, to the to the computing device itself. For for example, um, circuits radiate in the electromagnetic spectrum as they're executing. Um, they may very well radiate acoustically. Um, they, they don't have completely uniform power consumption and so on and so on and so on, many, many different ways having to do with the physics of the devices yeah. in, in which they can reveal something about what's being executed. For the most part, we take the view that what we're trying to protect ourselves against is adversaries who are um, removed from us by the network. And, yeah. and therefore, at most, the only side channels we have to worry about are the timing side channels. Should stop doing that. Okay, so that was basic crypto and side channels. Oh, by the way, did that answer your question about side channels? Um, it answers it in the sense that I was thinking more about caching side channels, and it doesn't seem like they're really concerned with that at all. Um, they they have worried about that. That is an aspect of, of time time dependency, and they have worried about that to some extent. But I I'm a little hazy on how far they've gone. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's 
more why I was asking because the paper doesn't really seem to like address which side channels. So yeah, I, I like uh, it does it does give more information. So I appreciate it. Thank you. I think they actually address this pretty well. Uh, what you basically do is you make it an you define observations as being every memory address you touch, and then you make sure that regardless of the secret, you touch the same memory addresses. Which presumably will cause the cache to behave in the same way. Exactly, yeah. Like it's, but we assume if, that caches are value independent, right? I mean, but uh, touching them, making sure that they touch the right memory address isn't exactly sufficient because like, you need to make sure that you touch them in the exact same order. Yeah, yeah. So that's, also, that's all part of the observation is... And doesn't exactly that, what sequence of memory doesn't access that increase efficiency of the code though? Because if they're if they have a lot of like kind of dead dead code that's being executed to access all of the same memory addresses, how do they claim to still be efficient? With you don't have that kind of dead code in, in a crypto algorithm. We're only talking about the low level crypto primitives here, because they're the only ones that depend on the key. No, so so like so if they have a situation where it's like you know, if this bit of the key is a load memory address B or otherwise load memory address C, how can they say that, you know, no matter what that bit is, we're going to load both B and C just because we want to make sure that the cache is going to be the same no matter which branch is executed, but still say that that's efficient. This is all fairly independent of uh, Everest. So they, they follow the standard practice, which is I would describe it as a lot of clever tricks in the algorithms themselves. Okay. Um, so that they don't end up really having this inefficiency. Okay. Uh, they also have hardware support. So like you, you cleverly use hardware instructions. Okay. Okay. So that was low level crypto. The next level up from there is the so-called crypto protocol, i.e. I'm sitting on my machine and Amazon is sitting on Amazon's machine. We're trying to get a, a, a key set, set up and shared between the two of us so that we can actually invoke these low level crypto algorithms using that key to encrypt the data. So how does that work? Well, this is a somewhat oversimplified story of how it works. First, you do key exchange. And you know, the magic of Diffie-Hellman key exchange, uh, which I'm not going to explain, gives you a shared secret, which I've written K Diffie-Hellman, um, between yourself and the counterparty of the Diffie-Hellman exchange. But the problem is, all you know is that you've shared this with somebody. You don't know who the somebody is. And in particular, in the case of a man in the middle attack, if I'm trying to communicate with Amazon, what the man in the middle will do is he'll set up a Diffie-Hellman connection with me, and he'll set up another Diffie-Hellman connection with Amazon, and then he'll just take all the messages that I send to Amazon, decrypt them. They're all going to go through him. He can, he can decrypt them all because he set up the connection with me. So you know, here's the situation. Here's me. Here's Amazon. And here's the man in the middle. So instead of the data go, doing what it's supposed to do, which is go like that, it goes like this. And he gets to see everything by virtue of having set up two different human connections where I thought there was only one. So how do you fix that? The answer is you have to authenticate the fact that this key speaks for some principle. Yeah. And in particular, in this example, the principle we want the key to speak for is Amazon. And the way you're going to achieve that here is you're going to have a certificate that says that there's some key that speaks for some string. So what is a certificate? A certificate is a pile of bits that are digitally signed using the signing mechanism that we talked about earlier that assert that Amazon's key speaks for Amazon. What that means is if I see something encrypted or signed by the Amazon key, I should believe that it's coming from Amazon. Uh, who should I trust to make a statement like that for me? Well, in, uh, in the example that, uh, that I put on the slide, 
The answer is I'm trusting a, a, a certi so-called certificate authority called VeriSign to make that statement. And my browser actually has wired into it, wired, wired into it the public key, signing key of VeriSign, this K VeriSign here, is actually wired into my browser and yours too, along with several hundred other keys of so-called top-level certificate authorities. And then what's gonna happen is that Amazon is gonna use its K Amazon key to sign something that says the Diffie-Hellman key speaks for Amazon. And then I'm gonna verify that using this verification thing. This, this should have been uh, K Amazon. And then I'm, as a result of that, I'm gonna know that Amazon had, has you know, authenticated the Diffie-Hellman key, key that I negotiated in, at this step up here. So we, have, we started out with this key, which we didn't know, really know anything about because we didn't know who the counterparty was. But now Amazon is telling us using this K Amazon key, signing key that we learned from the certificate, Amazon is now telling us that the Diffie-Hellman key is actually good. It, this is a relatively simple story the way I told it. Unfortunately, in real life, certificates are very complicated. They have many features. They have a complex binary encoding. And typically, yeah, it's, it's not enough to just have one certificate. You need yeah, to have a whole so-called chain of certificates um, because not everyone gets a certificate directly from VeriSign. VeriSign may delegate its authority to the sub-certificate authorities and perhaps do that to several levels. And, and there's a lot of complicated code for, for parsing the certificate chains. And then the whole thing has been made, you know, made much worse by the fact that it was, this is the one remaining piece of machinery left over from the failed attempt to, attempt to compete with TCP IP using an international standard called OSI. Uh, all parts of which I believe have been successfully replaced by internet things, except for this one certificate piece of certificate machinery called X509. And these internet, these international OSI standards typically were pretty complicated because the way they got made was that there was an international committee. And to oversimplify things slightly, Everyone that was on the committee got, uh, got to put their pet feature into the standard. So the net result of all that is there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the certificate authentication. There are many options, uh, some of which are there for uh, compatibility with the way thing, things were done 10 years ago because uh, there are still plenty of browsers and plenty of websites running code that was written 10 years ago. Some of them are there for performance, some of them are uh, there for various convenience reasons. And uh, it's uh, part of the Everest project to verify all this code. And uh, although I believe they have not yet completed that project. Next level up from the certificate from the crypto protocols is parsing. Uh, crypto uh, works on bit strings, strings of zeros and ones. But in order to get anything done, you have to be able to parse the, the bit strings into something meaning, meaningful, think, think something like an AST uh, or a piece of JSON. And we want the parser and the serializer to work. Sorry, I keep forgetting to do that. We want the parser and the serializer to work exactly like the, the encrypt and decrypt guys. That is, we want the serializer to turn a message into a strings of zeros and ones and the parser to turn it back into something meaningful. And with complex formats, I, there are lots of chances for bugs there too. So that motivated the Everest guys to do something that isn't described in the paper, but it was a fairly important part of the project called Everpart, which produces, produces verified parsers for these complex binary formats. Okay, so we're making rapid progress here, which is good because we're almost out of time. Um, what about TLS? 
we've been down in the weeds up to now, but now we've gotten, we've gotten up to TLS. Now TLS has two parts. There's the so-called handshake, which is the part that sets up and authenticates the keys, which we've just been talking about. And then there's the so-called record protocol, which actually transmits the data. The basic idea of the handshake is, I chat with Amazon and we negotiate some crypto parameters, what algorithms should be used, what key lengths should be used and so on and so forth. And there are jillions of possible key yeah, crypto param yeah. parameters yeah. named in a, in a fairly complicated way. Then we use Diffie-Hellman to get a shared master key. Then we authenticate, uh, am, I authenticate Amazon's key, host key using the certificates. And then finally, we authenticate the whole thing, thing because the host key signs a statement that says yeah. that the master key that we agree, yeah. agreed on is, is what is a good one. And here, here are the crypto parameters that, was, that were used in setting it up. And there are many complications in this whole handshake idea. It involves half a dozen messages sent back and forth between the two guys. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of legacy issues there. There's issues of efficiency. You try to minimize the number of messages. You want to be able to, to change the key in the middle in case you've used it. You, the, in case the connection lasts for a long time and you've uh, encrypted so many bits that the key ought to be changed and so forth. And my understanding is the Air Force guys are currently in the middle of trying to actually verify the whole handshake protocol. And then on top of that, there's the record protocol, which they say they have verified, which is much simpler. It involves encrypting the record with the, with the, 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 diffi with the key K, which is derived from the master key in some non-trivial way, send it through the network, decrypt it, and, and authenticate it with K. So that's the story of TLS. Um, this part, they've already verified, and this part they're working on. And finally, on top of that, we have HTTPS, the goal of which is to deliver good pages to the browser client. And my understanding is the main issue there with respect to Everest is uh, HTTPS has to call, HTTPS itself has a fairly straightforward spec, but it has to call uh, TLS through this rather complicated interface. And there are a lot of ways to get that wrong. Okay, and that's pretty much covered the ground. And we've got a few minutes. That people would like to ask questions about this whole ambitious story. Oh, and is it working? Uh, big chunks of this are deployed in a variety of pl places, as they've described some in the paper and other, others more modern ones uh, on the, on the um, websites that they maintain. So I would say, it, yeah, it's working pretty well. And I think it's fair to say, this is the most ambitious attempt that anyone has made so far to actually deploy a significant hunk of yeah. code uh, with a fair, yeah. fair number of internal complications uh, at scale. So in that respect, it's, it is an extremely ambitious project. Questions? Everyone is stunned. As I was saying, it has a lot of moving parts. And they, there are a few of them on which they focus most of their attention so far. The low-level crypto, um, the parsing, and the uh, mechanics of actually del delivering the data over the TLS connection. Five or 10 years from now, perhaps, after people have made attempts to attack this deployment, we'll have a you know, better empirical idea than we do now about how successful it was. My own guess is that the biggest danger is gonna be that 
they probably are not going to be successful. They're probably going to be forced to, for compatibility reasons to, to um, still implement a fairly complicated interface into TLS. And yeah. there's still going to be a lot of opportunities for people to misuse it. Uh, if anyone has done a careful analysis, not so much of the bugs, but of what you should do to prevent them with it, without breaking too much compatibility, I have not seen it. I have a quick question. Yep. So like how, uh, I might've missed this, but how exactly does um, uh, Everest like prevent a lot of the attacks you mentioned like log jam, et cetera? Yeah. Th those attacks you know, are all based on, on um, flaws in the implementation. What I did in, in the last half hour was to sketch, it, sketch out the essential ideas of why you should think that a TLS connection is going to be secure. But there are a lot of ways to mess up. Um, the most obvious ones, you know, a large, and a large fraction of the ones that are described in the, the most dangerous code in the world paper, um, a lot of them are, are based on the fact that it, it, it turns out to be very easy to use TLS in such a way that although you th think you're authenticating a connection to amazon.com, you're actually not authenticating a connection to amazon.com and you don't really know who, who the connection ended up being authenticated to. And, and flaws of that kind make it possible to run these man in the middle attacks. With the exception of Heartbleed, I think all, all the other attacks that I know about are men in the middle attacks of one form or another that depend on, on um, breaking the authentication mechanism. Because once you've broken the authentication mechanism, then when I set up my connection, I don't know that I'm, I may think I'm talking to Amazon, but I could be wrong. I could be talking to somebody else. So really one major component of this is just the verification of the authentication. Um, That's right. Their TLS. So that, that is the source of, the, of the, probably the majority of the bugs that, that people have uh, found in the wild. Heartbleed is a, a striking exception. That was a straightforward buffer overrun caused by, by the fact that, the, that, that an incoming message wasn't being parsed correctly. Okay, got it. Thanks. So as I say, when I was talking about the, the hunter and the bear issue, yeah. heartbleed is something you really have to wor worry about because it's really easy for anyone to exploit it. All the man in the middle attacks, I think, you have to be pre pretty compulsive to worry a lot about them compared to other things that you should be worrying about in security, like phishing attacks. Other questions? Okay, then we'll see you next week. Thank we'll you. We'll be talking about um, the We'll be talking more, more about how to set, set up uh, abstraction relations and, and carry out uh, simulation proofs. Thank you.